أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We've reached verse number 112 of Surah At-Tawbah and verse number 112 says the repentant, the worshippers, the praisers, the fasters, the bowers, the prostrators and those who enjoin good and forbid evil and those who maintain the limits set by God and give glad tidings to the believers. In our last session, we spoke about the promise of paradise that was given to those who joined the Prophet in the Battle of Tabuk, who sacrificed and put their lives in danger to defend Islam and to support the Holy Prophet. Now, the Battle of Tabuk, after mentioning the Battle of Tabuk and the various struggles associated with it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this promise of paradise. Now, the Battle of Tabuk, as you know, it represents a struggle against an external enemy, what we would call in the Islamic tradition as Al-Jihadul Asghar. Now, after speaking about the Battle of Tabuk and the great reward Allah Azza wa Jal has attached to those who join the Prophet and make that sacrifice, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala then shifts the focus of the verse and He speaks about an internal struggle. So you have this contrast between fighting in the battlefield, in the Battle of Tabuk, and this internal struggle. Because in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the qualities of the people of paradise. So, there, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises Jannah, and then here He lists and He enumerates the qualities of those who will enter paradise, who will be granted paradise. And you see that these qualities are qualities that a person has to cultivate within themselves. It's qualities that you have to struggle to instill in yourself. So there are nine qualities that are mentioned here. So again, Allah speaks about the battle of Tabuk, which is the external jihad which is the lesser jihad. And then here, there are certain character traits that the mu'mineen possess. And these are traits that can only be acquired through self-struggle, through jihadul nafs, which is what we call al-jihadul akbar, the greater struggle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first quality that he mentions, interestingly, is the people of Jannah are at Ta'ibun. Now, of all of the qualities that Allah could have mentioned, it's interesting that the first quality that's mentioned is that the believers, the people of paradise, are the repentant. Now, this is very logical because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, the primary addressees in this verse are the individuals who have just come back from the Battle of Tabuk, which is the most difficult military struggle that they've experienced. It's a, it's, a, it's a military expedition against a formidable enemy, the Romans. So you can imagine that those who are coming back from the Battle of Tabuk may develop this sense of this false security that you know, we participated in the Battle of Tabuk and therefore, you know, we are the elite in the eyes of God. That we are guaranteed paradise. You know, sometimes when you do good, you become blind towards your shortcomings. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the onset, He mentions the virtue of repentance. And it's as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that don't think that you are immune from punishment just because you participated in the battle of Tabuk. Believers are always repentant. Meaning that 
you should focus more on your shortcomings than on your good deeds. So the, belief, the people of Jannah are at taibun They repent. They repent for their past sins. We've committed many sins that we can't even remember. You know, when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, you know, the, the Urafa, they say that repentance, true repentance, takes place when you identify the sin that you're asking Allah to forgive you for. That you have to have ma'rifah of the sin. In many cases, unfortunately, we ask Allah to forgive us and to pardon us, and we, we actually can't even recall the sins that we've committed. You know, because we've taken them so lightly that we commit so many that we don't even remember, we can't even recall them. So sincere repentance happens when you're able to recall those sins. So Allah mentions tawbah. Now, tawbah is not only related to sin. So even if someone even if, even if someone has not committed a sin, you can't say that, oh, because I haven't committed a sin, I don't need to be a ta'ib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in the hadith, we find many traditions that speak about the virtue of repentance irrespective of whether a sin has been committed or not. So for example, Allah in the Quran, He says, وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Allah addresses the believers, all of the believers, and He says, Repent, O you who believe, all of you. And the Prophet ﷺ is among them because the Prophet is, he is the head of the believers. He is the Imam of the Mu'mineen. So even the Prophet is asked to repent. We have a hadith that tell us that the Prophet used to do istighfar, he used to make tawbah, he used to repent 70 times a day. Now the question is, why is the Prophet repenting? You and I, we repent, we do tawbah because of our sins. We repent for our sins. The ma'asumin, the infallibles, the Prophet and the Imams, they repent not from sin. They repent and they ask God to forgive them for their inability to thank Him and worship Him as He deserves. So everyone has to make tawbah, whether you sin or not. We repent for our sins. The prophets and the imams, they repent and they ask God to pardon them for their inability to thank God as He deserves to be thanked. Because no one is capable of thanking Allah and worshiping Him as He deserves to be worshipped. So number one is tawbah. The first quality of the people of Jannah is that they are a ta'ibun. Now after you repent, you know, after you ask God for forgiveness, does your responsibility end there? Is it enough to just say that, oh God, pardon me for my past sins? That's not enough. After you repent, after your slate is wiped clean through tawbah, you have to, you need, you, it has to be followed by ibadah. It has to be followed by worship. So at ta'ibun, and the next, the next quality is what? Al-abidun. Those who are obedient, those who engage in worship. And then, after the second quality, you know, people when they think of worship, they think of the rituals associated with worship. But it, but so for the first quality is that they are repentant. The second is that they are worshipers. They engage in ibadah. And then the third quality onward is essentially different expressions of ibadah. That this ibadah, that worship takes on different forms. Worship manifests itself in different ways. It has different expressions. One of the ways in which worship is expressed is al-hamidun, the third quality. The praisers. The believers are those who are God-conscious, 
and they are conscious of the continual flow of divine blessings that they're always engaged in Allah's praise they're expressing this gratitude to him they they recognize that all of the good that they have in their lives is from him that he is the source of all khayr you know biyadihi al khayr so they are the praisers so i want you to pay attention to how ibadah engages every part of our being so al hamidun ibadah engages the tongue because people when they praise god typically hamd happens on at the level of the tongue at taibun al abidun al hamidun number 4 is as saihun the word saihun comes from the word siyaha the word siyaha literally means to travel to travel now the people of jannah are those who travel now what does this mean when you travel you have a point of departure and you have a destination you have a, you know a, a direction now the the mu'min the people of jannah they are called as-sa'ihun meaning that they're traveling they're moving away from something towards something else you know that's what you do when you travel you depart from one location and you move towards another location now the people of jannah they are engaged in a spiritual travel a spiritual journey and they are departing from the lowly material world and they are journeying towards god so they're they're engaged in this this travel this spiritual voyage now there's a hadith from the holy prophet now what are the what are the types of rituals that help us that facilitate this movement away from dunya towards god the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi he says inna sa'ihin humus sa'imun that the travelers are those who fast so fasting so the the meaning of the word sa'ihun is that the people of jannah are those who fast because when you fast what do you do you know fasting is the only ritual where you are refraining you're not actually doing something you are refraining from even the permissible enjoyments of dunya so you build that you're able to kind of build the spirit of detachment so fasting helps us detach from dunya and it facilitates our travel and our journey towards god so the believers are the repentant they are the worshipers worship is expressed in verbal hamd al hamidun so ibadah engages the tongue as saihun it engages the heart you know when you fast you're you're training the heart to disengage from the material world ar raki'un as sajidun the the people of jannah the believers are the bowers and the prostrators now the bowing and prostrating is associated with salah with the the canonical prayers that we perform and therefore you see that ibadah also engages our limbs so hamidun engages the tongue sa'ihun engages the heart raki'un and sajidun engages the limbs so this is the beauty of ibadah that worship in the islamic tradition is dynamic and it's it's multifaceted it engages all aspects of our being and then 
what's mentioned after Raki'un and Sajidun, you know, up until now, so Ta'ibun, Abidun, Hamidun, Sa'ihun, Raki'un, Sajidun, these are all personal practices. But Ibadah is not only about facilitating your personal journey towards God. Worship is not a personal endeavor. And therefore you see that Allah, He says, Al-Amiruna bil ma'roof wa nahuna al munkar In the Islamic tradition, you are not only responsible for your own spiritual, spiritual well-being, you have a moral duty to uphold morality on the societal level, that you have to enjoin good, you have to be a motivator, you have to encourage people to do good, to get closer to God, to do righteous deeds. Al-Amiruna bil ma'roof wa nahuna anil munkar. You also have a responsibility to forbid evil. And forbidding evil doesn't just mean that if you see someone drinking or you see someone slacking on their prayers, that you advise them. It also means speaking truth to power. When governments are oppressive, you have to speak out. You can't just say that, oh, I do tawbah, I praise Allah, I, I bow, I prostrate, I fast. Ibadah is not only limited to these rituals. Ibadah also extends to the world of social justice and nahuna al munkar and this is why we have a very beautiful hadith a hadith qudsi where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he addresses prophet shu'aib now shu'aib alayhi salam as many of you know he's the prophet who's mentioned in the quran and he was sent to the people of Median. And he eventually becomes the, the father-in-law of Nabi Musa alayhi salam. And Shu'aib, the problem that he had with this community, you know, many, many communities are, are known for certain sins. So for example, the community of Lut was known for their, their sexual misconduct. The community of Shu'aib, they were notorious for their unethical business dealings. They were corrupt merchants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reveals to Shu'aib, Ya Shu'aib. So the hadith is that Allah reveals to Shu'aib, Ya Shu'aib, inni mu'adhibun min qawmika mi'ata alf. O Shu'aib, I have decreed that I will punish, I will be punishing 100,000 members of your community. 40,000 among them are corrupt, they're evil, they're wicked. And 60,000 of them are good. So Allah says, I'm going to punish 100,000. 40,000 of them are wicked, they're corrupt. 60,000 of them are good. So you can imagine, Shu'aib is a bit puzzled here. He says, Ya Rab, al ashrar that I understand why your punishment will descend upon the evildoers, the 40,000. Why is it that you're going to punish the 60,000 who were not engaged in unethical business dealings? They weren't corrupt merchants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Allah says to Shu'aib that yes, these 60,000 they were not corrupt merchants. They were not cheating people in the marketplaces. But they remained silent. They didn't speak out against the corruption in the society. And they never they were never angered when I was angry. So you see, brothers and sisters, 
from this hadith, we understand that all that is required for corruption to spread is for good people to remain silent. It's for good people to remain silent. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He enumerates the qualities of the people of paradise, He begins with tawbah, and then He mentions ibadah, and then He speaks about the different expressions of ibadah, and then ends with al-amiruna bil ma'ruf wal nahuna ala munkar, enjoining good and forbidding evil, wal hafiduna li hududillah, that the believers are those who maintain the limits set by God, meaning that they're, they're conscious of what God has made prohibited and what He has forbidden. That whenever they want to do anything, their first question is, is this halal? Is this permissible? You know, when someone comes up to them with a business idea, with a business venture, with a business proposal, your first question should be that, is everything that we're doing within the boundaries of the sharia? So these are the types of believers. These are the people of paradise. وَبَشِّرِ mu'min And give glad tidings to the believers. Meaning that these are those who will receive the glad tidings of paradise. Now, there is an interesting story associated with this particular verse. You know, brothers and sisters, one of the, one of the greatest challenges that Imam Zainul Abidin, our fourth Imam, faced was the Imam السلام, on one hand, because he was the son of Imam al Hussein, you can imagine that the Umayyads were very cautious. You know, they were afraid of Imam Zain al Abidin. They kept a close eye on the fourth Imam because, you know, this is the son of the man who rebelled against the government, who led an uprising. So naturally, the Umayyads are going to keep a close eye on him. So Imam Zain al-Abideen, on the one hand, he felt great pressure from the Umayyads. There was constant surveillance. And on, then on the other hand, you have people who are followers of the Imam, who are Shias, who are criticizing the Imam for not rising up. So for example, Imam Zain al-Abideen on one occasion, He's leaving Medina to go towards Mecca to perform Hajj. Now, and the Imam alayhi salam was joined by many people. You know, he would walk on foot from Medina to Mecca. There was a man by the name of Ubad al-Basri. Ubad al-Basri. Presumably he was Shia. So he meets the Imam, he runs into the Imam on their way to Mecca. So Ubad al-Basri is heading towards Mecca for Hajj, and he runs into Imam Zain al-Abideen salam. And he says the following to the Imam. He essentially criticizes Imam al-Sajjad. He says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, O grandson of the Prophet, Tarakta al-jihada wa su'bata wa aqbalta ila al-hajj wa lina. So he takes a swipe at the Imam. He says to him, O grandson of the Prophet, you have abandoned uh, jihad because of its difficulty, and you are coming and you are advancing towards Hajj because of its ease. So he's essentially saying that you're not like your father, Imam al Hussein. Your father was a revolutionary. Your father fulfilled his responsibility of fighting against tyrants. And he quotes an ayah from the Qur'an. He quotes verse number 111 of Surah at tawbah which is the, the ayah that we ended with last week. So he tells the imam that your responsibility is to rise up, to, to stand up against the Umayyads. And he recites, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَيَقْتُلُونَ وَيُقْتَلُونَ He says that the believers are those who fight in the way of God and they're, they either, they're either slain or they are slain. 
So he recites this verse, and then the ayah continues with the promise of paradise. So Ubad al-Basri cites this ayah of the Quran to basically say to the Imam that you're, you're not fulfilling your duty, that your duty is to stand up against these tyrants and to fight in the way of God. So then Imam Zain al-Abideen, he lets him finish the verse. So the Imam alayhi salam, he tells him, finish What's the next verse? So Abad al Basri recites, In Allah ashtara min al mu'minin anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al jannah. He recites that verse and he stops at verse 111. The Imam says, Continue, continue the verse. The Imam, he continues. He says, At ta'ibun, al abidun, al sa'ihun, al raki'un, al sajidun. الآمرون بالمعروف والناهون على المنكر والحافظون لحدود الله وبشر المؤمنين. إمام زين العابدين says to عباد البصري after reciting the verse that we recited, verse number one twelve, which enumerates the qualities of the believers. إمام زين العابدين he says to عباد البصري find me believers with these qualities and I will be the first one to draw my sword. So you see, brothers and sisters, this was the challenge of Imam Zain al-Abidin. He wasn't able to, to, to launch a military attack on the Umayyads because he didn't have individuals who exhibited these qualities, who possessed these qualities. Verse number 113. ما كان للنبي والذين آمنوا أن يستغفروا للمشركين ولو كانوا أولي قربة من بعد ما تبين لهم أنهم أصحاب الجحيم. It is not for the prophet and those who believe to seek forgiveness for the idolaters, even if they be kin, after it has become clear to them. That they shall be the inhabitants of the hellfire. Now, when the mu'minin, when the companions of the Prophet, when they received this promise of paradise, you can imagine that they also wanted their family members to be with them in Jannah, to be with them in paradise. So they come to the Prophet and they ask the Prophet to make dua for their relatives who had passed away and who died as kuffar. So some of the companions, they have relatives, they have parents, grandparents who rejected Islam. And they're asking the Prophet to make dua that they will be reunited with them in paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this verse. ما كان للنبي والذين آمنوا أن يستغفروا للمشركين. It is not for the prophet and those who believe to seek forgiveness for the idolaters, even if they are your kin, even if they're your family members. Now the question that arises here is that some, when they read this verse, they understand that I'm not allowed to make du'a for non-Muslims. I'm not allowed to pray for relatives who died as non-Muslims. Is this what the verse is saying? The ayah very clearly mentions that you're not allowed to pray for relatives, for people who have died as, as non-Muslims. مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ after it has become clear to them that they shall be the inhabitants of hellfire. So for example, the prophet receives revelation that someone, you know, died as a, a munafiq. So the prophet would, would recite Salatul Mayyit doing four takbiras. Such a person, you don't make dua for them. Or for example, someone who had very clear enmity towards Islam. Allah says the Prophet and the believers are not to make dua, they're not to ask God to forgive someone who had enmity 
towards Islam and Muslims. But those who die as non-Muslims, but they have no enmity towards Islam, there's no problem in making dua for them. Now, Allama Taba Taba'i, when uh, he has a discussion, when he speaks about this verse, about why is it that you can't make dua for people who rejected Islam and who had enmity towards Islam. Allah Taba Taba'i basically says that because it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time to pray for someone who harbored hatred and malice and contempt for God's message. So Allah Taba Taba'i says that if someone rejected Islam and died as a non-Muslim and it was very clear that they had enmity towards Islam, praying for them is a waste of time and it is not befitting to ask for God, ask God for something that is meaningless. You know, in the same way that you don't waste the time of someone who's who you respect, you know, if you have a meeting with a president or a prime minister or a king or a scholar, you're not gonna ask something that's meaningless because it, it's it's disrespectful to make a request that is meaningless, that has no value. So it is not befitting to ask God to forgive and to pardon those who have contempt towards Islam because it's not befitting to ask God for something that is meaningless. Now, when the believers ask the Prophet to make dua for their relatives, and to pray and ask God to forgive relatives who had died as non-Muslims, the reason why they thought this was okay to do was because Ibrahim السلام, there's a verse in the Quran where it speaks about Ibrahim making a promise to do istighfar for his uncle who was a polytheist who was not only a polytheist, but he used to manufacture idols. So some of the believers, they defended their position that, what's, that there's no issue with praying for non-Muslims who rejected Islam because Ibrahim prayed for his disbelieving uncle. Allah says in Surah 19, verse 47, قَالَ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكَ Quoting Ibrahim, that I will ask God to forgive you. Verse number 114, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispels this misconception. Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ اسْتِغْفَارُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لِأَبِيهِ إِلَّا عَمَّ وَعِدَةٍ وَعَدَهَا إِيَّا فَلَمَّا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ أَنَّهُ عَدُوٌ لِلَّهِ تَبَرَّأَ مِنْ إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لَأَوَّاهٌ حَلِيمٌ Ibrahim's plea for forgiveness of his father, which is his uncle, because the word, the word Ab can be used for your biological father or your teacher or your uncle. فَلَمَّا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ أَنَّهُ عَدُوٌ لِلَّهِ تَبَرَّأَ مِنْهُ إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لَأَوَّاهٌ حَلِيمٌ Ibrahim's plea for forgiveness of his father was only due to a promise made to him. But when it became clear to him that he was among the disbelievers, he disassociated from him. Truly, Ibrahim was tender-hearted and forbearant. Now, what happened during the time of Ibrahim is that Ibrahim السلام, tells his uncle, you know, there's a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq where he mentions what exactly happened. So Ibrahim has an uncle who is a polytheist, who manufactures idols. Ibrahim essentially says to him that if you submit to God, I will ask him to pardon you for your past sins. So Ibrahim's offer to ask God to forgive his uncle was conditional on 
the submission of his uncle to the religion of God. And therefore, Ibrahim didn't just ask God to forgive his uncle. It was, it was a conditional offer that if you submit to the one true God, I will ask God to pardon you for your sins. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispels this misconception that some of the believers have because it seems that the Arabs had this understanding that Ibrahim did istighfar for his disbelieving uncle and therefore there's no problem if the Prophet, if we ask the Prophet and, and we also ask Allah to pardon and forgive our ancestors and our relatives who died rejecting Islam. And Allah at the end of the verse, he says, Inna Ibrahim la awahun hadim. You know, one of the unique qualities of Ibrahim in the Quran is that Ibrahim was a very tender hearted person. He had a very soft heart. And one of the verses that gives us a glimpse into the tender hearted nature of Ibrahim is ayah number 74 of Surah Hud, Surah number 11. When the angels came to visit Ibrahim and they gave him the, the news of a son that will be born to him, they also gave him the news that Allah's punishment will be descending upon the people of Lut. Allah says, فَلَمَّا ذَهَبَ عَنْ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْأَرَّوْعُ وَجَاءَتْهُ الْبُشْرَى يُجَادِلُنَا فِي قَوْمِ لُوتِ That when the angels said to Ibrahim that God's punishment is going to descend upon the community of Lut, Allah says that Ibrahim started to bargain and negotiate with the angels. Meaning that he was asking if it's possible to give them more time, to give them an opportunity to repent, to give them more time to turn back to God. So even the community of Lut, you see that Ibrahim is asking if there's a chance for them to be given more time so they can repent. Verse number 115. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِلَّ قَوْمًا مِّن بَعْدِ إِذْ هَدَاهُمْ حَتَّى يُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ مَا يَتَّقُونَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٌ It is not for God to lead a people astray after having guided them till He makes clear to them what they should be mindful of. Now, when the, when the companions came to the Prophet and they asked the Prophet to, to seek forgiveness for their relatives and their ancestors who died as non-Muslims, who rejected Islam because they wanted to be reunited with them in paradise, some of them thought that they had committed a sin by asking God to forgive them. So many of them, maybe before this verse was revealed, they had a habit of doing istighfar for relatives and ancestors who had enmity towards the religion of God. So they were concerned that maybe we, we were committing a sin. Maybe God is going to punish us for, for doing so. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says that God does not lead people astray after having guided them. That, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he does not punish until he makes something, he makes things clear. You know, this concept is called that God does not punish you, he does not lead you astray until he has made the truth clear. So it would be that it would be considered reprehensible to punish before explaining. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially is saying that, that, you, that no sin was committed because it's only a sin after the ruling has been revealed and then you go against it. So قُبْحُ الْعِقَابِ بِلَا بَيَانِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah 17 verse 15 for example, 
He says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا Allah does not punish a people until he sends them a messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too merciful. He is too just to punish until the truth has been made clear. Until things have been adequately explained and clarified. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them that you will not be led astray. You will not be punished for, for actions before they have been explained to you and, and before that before their prohibition has been made clear. Verse number 116, Inna Allah Surely to God belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. He gives life and causes death. Apart from God, you have neither protector nor helper. So here Allah is essentially saying that God has no reason to punish you for, for something that you were unaware of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not eager to punish you He's not eager to misguide you. Allah has nothing to gain from oppressing you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has nothing to gain from being unjust with you. Why? Because to him belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. Allah doesn't benefit from your worship, nor is he harmed by your disobedience. The entire cosmos belongs to him. He is the one who gives life and causes death. And you have no protector and no helper other than him. There's no need for There's no reason for him to be unjust or to be unfair. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ فِي سَاعَةِ الْعُسْرَةِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا كَادَ يَزِيغُ قُلُوبُ فَرِيقٍ مِّنْهُمْ God indeed forgave the Prophet and the emigrants and the helpers who followed him in the difficult hour after the hearts of a group of them nearly swerved. Then he forgave them, he pardoned them. Truly, he is kind and merciful to them. Now why does Allah say that he forgave the Prophet? If you recall, a few sessions ago, we mentioned that when some of the hypocrites ask the Prophet to pardon them from participating in the Battle of Tabuk, the Prophet gave them permission to stay behind. Because the Prophet knew that they would create nothing but trouble if they were to if he were to bring them with him on the on the Tabuk expedition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verses that we covered earlier, he tells the Prophet that it would have better it would have been better if you didn't give them permission to stay behind and expose them. So this is what it means when Allah Allah says, God forgave you. Meaning the Prophet. He didn't, he didn't want the, the munafiqeen to join, but Allah says that it would have been better if you allowed them, to, if you let them, if you allowed them to expose themselves because they weren't planning on joining you anyway. So you giving them permission, you know, uh, it, may, it made it more difficult for, for the other mu'mineen to discover their nifaq. God pardoned. The Muhajirin and the Ansar, الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ فِي سَاعَةِ الْعُسْرَةِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا كَادَ يَزِيغُ قُلُوبُ فَرِيقٍ مِّنْهُ So God pardoned the Muhajirin and the Ansar. You know, when you do something good, when you put yourself in danger, this act in and of itself facilitates the uh, the washing away of your of your sins. Now, this... The ayah mentions a group who followed him in the difficult hour after the hearts of a group of them nearly swerved. 
this part of the verse is related to an incident. And this is one of the reasons why this verse was revealed. So you have the Prophet setting out to go to the Battle of Tabuk. The companions, the Muhajirin and the Ansar, they join. Some of them were more reluctant than others, but in any, any case, they join. There was a companion of the Prophet by the name of Abu Khaythama. Abu Khaythama was one of the companions of the Prophet who didn't join the Prophet in the expedition of Tabuk. For whatever reason, he had logistical excuses or for whatever reason he stays he stays back and one day it was a very hot day he decides he tells his his wives and his his maids that he wants to have lunch outside so they erect a tent for him and his his wife one of his wives or his wives they come and they prepare food and they prepare some drinks so as he's sitting and he's enjoying his food and he's drinking this cold water and he's under the shade, it was a blazing hot day, sweltering heat. The Prophet had, had left Medina 10 days ago. So it's been 10 days since the Prophet and his companions left Medina for Tabuk. So Abu Khaythama is sitting there and then he has a moment of clarity, a moment of muhasana. You know, sometimes you have certain moments where you really assess yourself. So he thinks to himself that I'm sitting here enjoying this delicious food. I'm drinking this cold water, that I'm shielded from the rays of the sun while my prophet, Rasulullah, is traveling through this desert he's under the heat of the sun he's probably hungry and thirsty how can i call myself a true muslim while i'm sitting here comfortable while my prophet is suffering so he decides he tells his wives that i'm i'm gonna go join the prophet so he says so he gathers his materials he mounts his horse and he travels as fast as he can to catch up with the Prophet's caravan until he joins the Prophet. And then from a distance, the Prophet and his companions, they see a horseman approaching. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says to his companions, Kun Aba Khaytham, that I hope it's Abu Khaytham. So even the Prophet knew that this man had goodness in his heart. And, you know, subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, as I was reading this tradition, you know, it's amazing how we have certain people who join, who have, you know, these moments where, where they wake up, they make tawbah. You know, for example, on the day of Ashura, you have... Uh, Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. You know, he was on the side of Batil up until the last minute. Abu Khaythama, up until the last minute, he has this, uh, this moment of, of clarity, this moment of muhasaba, and he makes the right decision. During the time of, uh, of Imam al-Kadhim, since we're approaching the, uh, the days of his shahada, Many of you guys are familiar with the story of Bishr al-Hafi. Bishr was, was a young man in, uh, in Medina. And he, he, was, he was very wealthy. And he was known for throwing the most wild parties. So he's wealthy and he had a very... He lived in a mansion. And the youth in Medina or Baghdad, I'm not sure whether he was in Medina or Baghdad, but in any case, the youth in the city, they used to flock to his house. You know, every weekend, you know, if, if you want to see, he was always having parties, drinking, dancing, 
music. He'd invite singers. And he would do this, you know, week after week after week. And it became so bad, he was corrupting the youth to such an extent that many people, many families approached Imam al kadhim alayhi salam about it. So Imam al kadhim alayhi salam, one day he's passing by the house of Bishr. And he hears the music and the dancing. And as the Imam is passing by, one of the maids of Bishr is throwing out some trash. So Imam al kadhim alayhi salam, he says to this maid, Liman uh, al who does this house belong to? She says that it belongs to my master, it belongs to Bishr. My master Bishr, Imam al kadhim alayhi salam, he says, Sayyiduki, Hurrun and am Abd. Is your master, is he a slave or a free man? So the maid was puzzled by the question. She says, Bal Hur, that he's a free man. The Imam alayhi salam, he nodded. He says, he says, Naam. لو كان عبدا لله نستحى من الله. That you're right. He is a free man because if he were a slave of God, he would have a bit more shame. And the Imam walked away. The maid goes back inside of the house, and Bishop, sister, where have you been? She says that a, I had a conversation with a, a strange conversation with a man who was asking about about you. And she relays the story to him. And when he hears what the Imam said, it shook him. And he runs out of his house barefoot. This is why he's known as Bishr al-Hafi. Bishr the barefooted one. And he runs and he sees the Imam and he says to the Imam, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I've decided to give up this life. You know, sometimes... All it takes is a word of admonishment. You know, and when the Imam speaks, he speaks from the heart. You know, when, when words come from the heart, they penetrate into the hearts of people. So Bishr repents, he kicks everybody out of his house, he gets rid of all of the alcohol, and he becomes a very pious person. Now, the point that I want to mention here is some of the friends of Bishr, they ask him after he becomes religious that, Oh, Bishop, why do you think God gave you the tawfiq of hidayah? You know, there are many people that live sinful lives, but Allah never guides them. You know, why, why do you think Allah guided you? You know, you, you were living this life of sin. What did you do that Allah gave you the tawfiq of hidayah? that he graced you with the gift of guidance. Bishr, he says that, I'm not sure, but there's one thing that I did that I think that maybe it's because of this action that Allah guided me. That even though I was a bad person, I was sinful, when I was living that life of sin, I recall one good deed that I did. But I think because of it, Allah guided me. They say, what was it? He says, one night I was walking in the alleyways after a night of partying, committing haram. And I was walking in the alleyways. It was a very dark night. And I passed by a dumpster. And I saw a page of the Holy Quran. He says, I saw a page of the Quran and, and it had a lot of filth on it rubbish he says i saw that this was the page of the quran so i picked it up and i cleaned it i removed all of the najasa from it and i put it in i put it in a river so i i cleaned and i removed all of the impurities from that page of the quran and i put it in a river and i went to my house and i slept that night he says that night I had a dream. In the dream, 
I, I heard a voice speaking to me, but I could not see anyone. It was a voice that was reverberating and it was addressing me. Ya Bishop, in the dream, God spoke to me. Ya Bishop, tayyabta ismi la utayyibanna ismaka fi dunya wal akhir. O Bishop, you honored my name because on that page of the Quran, the name of Allah was there. You know, because if you open up any page of the Quran, chances are you're going to see the name of God or one of the names of God, one of the asma of Allah. So in the dream, the voice, Allah tells him that you purified my name. I will purify your name in this life and the hereafter. And shortly after that, I met Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al kadhim and he gave me that admonishment that forever changed my life. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahireen. Any questions or comments? We have a few moments. Uh, for verse uh, 115, could you explain a little bit about why it says that Allah, the, the first part of the verse where it says that it is, was not Allah's um, plan that he just said send people astray? Uh, what caused people to, why was that thought even brought up that this might be a concern? It sounds like there's a story there. Because as, as I mentioned, when... Uh... Many of the companions, many of the believers, they had, they had a habit of asking forgiveness for relatives who had died as non-Muslims. So they were already doing this. They were already making istighfar for relatives, for ancestors who died and had enmity towards Islam. So when this verse, when the verse was revealed, promising the mu'mineen jannah they decided to ask the prophet you know if he could also pray that their relatives be granted paradise with them so when when they asked the prophet this question and allah revealed the verses where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you're not allowed to pray for for those who have enmity towards islam after it is clear to you that they are from the inmates of the hellfire some of the companions some of the believers were afraid that okay so does that mean that all of these months and all of these years that we were doing istighfar for our relatives who had passed away does that mean that we were committing sins does that mean that god is going to lead us astray because we disobeyed him so allah reveals that it had done, that it is not for God to lead a people astray a after having guided them. That He's not gonna, that you're not gonna suffer the consequence of doing something that you didn't know was forbidden. That's what the verse means. So they, they were afraid that they were committing the sin and that because of it they would face the consequences of that. And Allah says that Allah is not gonna misguide you after having guided you. I guess it's just a, a the grammar. At least maybe it doesn't. It's a translation issue, where the grammar just sounds a bit odd because it it doesn't sound like it's talking about punishing people. It sounds like it's talking about people going being led astray after they've been led us they've been guided. So yeah, sometimes the, the yeah the translation doesn't really uh, do justice to the verse, but uh, but being being led astray is. Uh, is is one of the consequences of uh, of 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 doing something that's uh, that's haram. So you're not gonna you're not gonna face the consequences of your wrongdoing before you were even informed that it's something that you're not allowed to do. That that makes sense. So, and how how would this uh, I guess would this apply to situations where people are doing haram without realizing it is haram see th there's there are two types of ignorance you know there's there's what the ulama call al 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 jahilul 
Qasr, and then there's Al Jahil Al Muqasr. Al Jahil Al Qasr is someone who is justified in their ignorance. Now, what does this mean? So, for example, imagine you, you know, we'll take the example of, uh, let's take the example of Khums, for example. Let's say that you're a religious person, you attend lectures, you ask questions, but you know you, you just didn't know a specific ruling. Not because you were lazy, not because you weren't diligent, because you just you just missed you know uh, that piece of information. That is justifiable ignorance because you don't have a pattern of behavior where you're negligent. So sometimes someone is ignorant, but their ignorance is not a result of their negligence. So that that's they're excused. And then you have another group where, for example, you know, so if I give the example of wulu, so you have someone who who may have messed up with their wulu, but they uh, wulu is probably not a good example. But in any case, so you have you have someone. Who has justifiable ignorance justifiable ignorance they're not lazy they've done their due diligence they ask but they just didn't know a specific ruling and then you have someone else who is ignorant you know because they just didn't take the matter seriously enough they could have gotten the answer but there's a pattern of of negligence and taking the matter lightly so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obviously going to be less forgiving towards someone who was just lazy and who was uh who was negligent as opposed to someone who who made an effort but just got it wrong so the the negli being negligent sounds like uh, if you're negligent then you probably haven't been properly guided yet potentially yeah i mean it, you, i mean one of one of the the prerequisites of receiving hidayah is that you have to that you have to make uh, make an effort, as Allah says, "In Allah, la yughayiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusin." That there has to be, you know, a, a, a better verses. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا. That so, if if you want hidayah, there has to be this struggle that you have to strive. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا that you have to sincerely struggle, and then you will receive hidayah. But so if you're not struggling, if you're not putting in any effort, then you're going to be deprived of that guidance. And you're going to be held responsible for being misguided because you had control over the effort that you put in. Being guided, guided is not something you're simply born into. Exactly, exactly. So it, 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 requires, uh, it requires effort and, uh, and striving. Yeah, thank you. I think that's all the questions for today. But thank you very much, Shia. This was a lot. excellent class. Lots of lesson uh, messages to take home and practice. Inshallah, man. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala bless you all and guide you all. Uh, we're we're getting towards the end of the uh, of the surah. I think I would anticipate maybe two three sessions max. I think we'll be done with surah to, uh, Toba, and then uh, okay, and you guys sure. make a decision about what the next surah is going to be. Eric, think of uh, going. What, what, what do you think about going to with Surah Hujurat next? Surah Al Hujurat would be a very good verse. Well, a very good surah. Yeah. I think that would be good. Yeah. Surah Al Hujurat. Some of the ulama they say that it's also called Surah Al Akhlaq, the oh, really? surah of ethics. So yeah, it's uh, it it's, it provides one of the most comprehensive, uh, you know. Uh, codes of conduct for the Muslim community. So I I, I, I think that'll be a great uh, sort of to look at. Uh, in, inshallah, that, that, that sounds like a plan then. Inshallah, Jazakumullah, I'll see you guys next week. See you then, thank you very much, Sheikh. May Allah bless you,